السلام عليكم معكم شفق ميديكال مختصين بالعلاج في تركيا تشاهدون اليوم الحلقة الثانية من السلسلة الأسبوعية الشيقة مع البروفيسور تركي علي زيرة الخبير في علاج الباركنسون والاضطرابات الحركية في هذه الحلقة يشرح البروفيسور أدق تفاصيل عملية التحفيز العميق للدماغ نسأله في المقابلة لمن تكون مناسبة أعراضها الجانبية ومخاطر العملية على صحة المريض ونرى كذلك تجربة ونجاحات البروفيسور مع العملية على الصعيد العالمي um. Deep brain stimulation surgery devices, which are called as neurostimulators, actually, are consist of three parts. So, two tiny electrodes in the brain, which we put them, and the device itself, like battery and computer, like the cardiac pacemakers, we put on the chest under the skin, and two connection cables between electrodes and the device itself. So. Um, with that technology, we can deliver electricity in the brain, which is called as neuromodulation. And its importance is it's controllable, adjustable, and changeable. So uh, when we do this, after implanting the device, we can program these neurostimulators and we can find the best treatment modalities for these patients, particularly for their symptoms, side effects, or their uh, complications, whatever they have. So, uh, even when we do the surgery, after that, it's totally correctable, controllable, adjustable technology. We can modify the electrical stimuli, amplitude, frequency, and pass width. And then we can fix it for the best treatment results for the patient. So after the surgery, we program the devices, patients, uh, they come from outside clinics, like outpatients, and every single morning we see them, we adjust their medications and also the, their electricity parameters. Basically, neurostimulators are replacing medications. They are acting like medications effect. So that's why they are better than best medical therapy in the long term. So as long as the battery acts like medications, then we have a chance to reduce medications. So in follow-up examinations right after the surgery in the clinic, we usually increase electricity and decrease medications and try to make the best treatment options for the patient. And the ideal uh, thing is the lowest medical dosage with the highest clinical improvement. And we can describe deep brain stimulation surgery as revising the clock of the disease of the patient. When I operate on a patient like 10 years of disease duration, then I can bring that patient to the first or second year of the disease. It means that the patients who cannot move on their own, on themselves, or need some help for feeding or turning in the bed or doing their daily lives, they, they go back almost normal levels of their life. Of course, it's not a cure. We're not eliminating the disease. We are treating the motor symptoms of the disease. So we can bring back the motor effects back to the patient. So they can go back their almost normal life. They can even turn back their jobs and they can also add many things to the community. And as you know that the Parkinson's is not only one patient's disease, it usually affects the family, like helping that patient, supporting it, trying to, it, his or her feeding or movements in the bed. So when you treat the family, actually, when you treat the patient, actually you treat the family. So you are helping many people. هل عملية التحفيز مناسبة لجميع الأعمار؟ Professor. Uh, age is a matter, but it's not the only thing. So we can operate on in a patient like 60 years of age and even 80 years of age. And sometimes we cannot operate the patient in a 60 years of age. Uh, if the patient is an elderly patient, after 70s, we usually think twice. After 75s, maybe we need to think three times. But if the treatment if the surgery is the only option, there is no other way for that patient. And, and if it helps too much to that patient, and if there is no contraindication, if the, even the patient has an age, but the, uh, the brain's structures are good, 
or the, his mental or her mental sta status is good, then we can do the surgery. Because every candidate of the surgery is usually evaluated by cardiologists, anesthesiologists, necessary consultations, and also psychiatrists. So uh, the patient needs to be verify all of them that they, the, the patient is suitable for the surgery. So if it happens, and uh, we can do the surgery if it's crucially necessary in a patient at the age of 85, for example. But if the patient is not suitable for the surgery, if we cannot help that patient that much with the surgery, or if the patient is not a pure Parkinson's disease, for example, uh, we cannot do the surgery. So age is a matter, but it is not the only thing, actually. What are the related to Surgery, as all kinds of surgery, has its complications. Uh, this is an awake surgery. We are talking with the patient, almost semi-sitting position, and we can make two tiny burr holes to the skull and putting the electrodes, tiny electrodes in the brain. But in this procedure, even it's two hours of procedure, we are inserting some electrodes in the brain to listen to the cells or putting the DBS electrodes. So we may hit any vessel, for example, and we may cause some bleeding. So one of the complications of the surgery can be said as vascular problems like bleeding or clotting or something like that, which can be said as roughly 1%. So if it happens, what happens? We can say that it can be a spectrum. Nothing happens small headache, or we can only see it with controlled CT scan, or some little symptoms, or severe bleeding, then the patients can become hemiplegic or even die. When we look at the worst scenario, the worst thing is about maybe one out of 1,000 or 10,000. Actually, I have operated on more than 1,300 cases, and I haven't seen any single case except just one small bleeding. So. Uh, it is very rare, I would say, in experienced hands, of course. Every, you know, institutions, especially if they are teaching institutions, uh, there are some learning curves and higher risks and complications rates. But uh, in experienced hands, I think the, these risks are quite low. The other risk could be the infection. It happens in every single case, like tonsillectomy, appendectomy, whatever. And we would say that it's one percent. Uh, if the infection happens, then it needs to be treated with antibiotics, and mostly it could be done. But since there is an implant in the brain or around the body, then uh, the infection may not be treated with antibiotics, and very rarely the removal might be necessary. Uh, if you look at these rates in, in many clinics, around 5%, but as I would say, uh, in experienced hands, uh, it could be diminished very, very low levels if possible. Uh, we actually uh, don't see such kind of complications, luckily. So, um, after the surgery, uh, as I mentioned, these are all controllable, arrangeable, programmable devices. Of course, if we give certain level of electricity in the brain, then it may cause some side effects. We usually try that in some testing periods also. But if we face that, then we can modify or adjust it so we can get rid of the side effects. One of the biggest advantages of that, I think, for deep brain stimulation surgery is that because if you are not happy with that, Luckily, it didn't happen, but we can shut down the system or we can take it off. So we can turn back the beginning levels for the brain. In, we used to do some lesioning surgeries like radio frequency, like laser-like treatment. But whatever we do, even with the sharpest arrangements and calculations, you know, in that technique, you are sending a bullet. You're not taking it back. DBS, you can modify the electricity and you can reverse it or you can close it down. And in the future, if there is some, any better treatment can happen, then we can do that. I also have some patients, for example, I, first of all, the patient had only tremor for a long time I, and I inserted two electrodes in the brain and I stopped the tremor. But in years, after 10 years, for example, the other symptoms of Parkinson's like slowness, rigidity, 
happens and they get worse and worse. And I can put two more electrodes in the brain. No, that patients, for example, have four electrodes in the brain and two devices. It's possible. In DBS surgery, you can do that. But in lesioning, it is not very practical or it's not very possible. في هذه الحالة هل تعتبر العملية مضاعفة؟ Of course, and, and that's why I'm not doing simple tremor targeting surgery on Parkinson's disease because in the, in the years I learned that tremor, uh, of course it's gone, but in many years that we can, these are the thalamic area in target. If we put the electrode in the thalamic area, you can stop tremor, whatever kind of is, even it's in positional tremor, not in Parkinson's tremor. But in Parkinson's disease, when years goes on, other symptoms are limiting the clinical benefit. And then we, can, we need to do second surgery. So for now, for example, I'm not recommending these patients the thalamic surgery, directly subthalamic nucleus stimulation surgery, because eventually in a long term, that patient needs that intervention, even though they don't seem uh, they would need that uh, in the previous years. تشاهدون في الحلقة القادمة الأمراض المستعصية الأخرى من غير الباركنسون التي يمكن علاجها بعملية تحفيز العميق للدماغ